Uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar, this is, oh, and I did this again. Pardon me. Oh, I, that's what it was. Oh, I have to accept. There we go. I had to accept that we are recording. So just want to let you know, um, welcome to you folks in the room. Just to let you know, we are recording this for Zoom. So uh, please just be mindful of your background um, noises. And for you folks on Zoom, welcome. And Patty is um, managing the Zoom room today. So if you have any uh, comments, questions, feedback, please feel free to share that in the chat box. And Patty will bring that into the room and we'll be able to share that with our speaker. So um, we are here today for the Princeville Mo'olelo free speaker series, bringing us together in this beautiful space here in collaboration with the Princeville at Hanalei Community Association to hear all kinds of great different stories from different wildlife conservation voices around our island. It's our honor to be here every month. And for those who are maybe less familiar with who we are, this is also my chance for a monthly plug uh, to remind everyone who we are um, as Friends of Kauai Wildlife Refuges. We're really honored uh, for 41 years to serve as the dedicated nonprofit friends group that's been established to help support the incredible work of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, that manages our three national wildlife refuges that this island is blessed to have. Uh, if you're not as familiar, Kilauea Point, of course, is open to the public and is a refuge for endangered seabirds. And Hanalei and Hulei'ia are our other two refuges, and they are not open to the public, uh, but those are refuges for endangered wetland birds. So serving a very different uh, mission and habitat. But again, to have three spaces on this island set aside for wildlife to, uh, to uh, feed, nest, thrive, and just be a part, of our, um, a part of our island is an incredible blessing. So that's who we are. How do we help? Basically, we are a gateway to help channel the generosity and love of our community in service and support of the work of, the, of our refuge system. So we uh, share financial resources that we generate through um, sales out at the nature store at Kilauea Point and do fundraising and community outreach to help uh, elevate people's awareness. And with those funds that we generate, we're able to provide that back to Fish and Wildlife and basically plug in and help finish out programmatic um, costs that um, they wouldn't otherwise be able to cover. So with that, we have a whole host of things that we do on a regular basis. Um, there are many opportunities for you to be continue to be a part of what we do, visiting us out at Kilauea Point, volunteering. We have a couple of, you know, some re really great recurring opportunities. Um, just a quick plug for the monthly Whedon Watch. It's the third Thursday of um, each month. An incredible opportunity to be out at Kilauea Point after the gate is closed, when all the seabirds are coming back and circling around, and as we start to watch the, the sun descend. So you get a sunset, the wildlife, and knowing that you're helping to keep Kilauea Point safe for our seabirds. So if you're interested in more information, one of the ways that you can help is to follow us through our email newsletter. Um, if anyone is not already plugged into that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and you'll hear from me once a month on the uh, other side of that newsletter. And through that, we share volunteer opportunities um, to help. And one other way to help is I'm really delighted to share with you that uh, we're approaching next month the second annual Guided Sunset Park Tour. It's a really great collaboration uh, between our friends group and the Princeville Wamakai Golf Course. And we're going to help raise money for our mission by enjoying a great uh, night out on the golf course, um, riding around in golf carts, hearing about our mission, enjoying sunset. It's a delightful evening. So if you'd like more information, uh, we can chat after the event. And my shameless little plug for what gets us up in the morning. This is the time of year, of course, for our beautiful mole. Um, we have a beautiful taxidermy specimen here as well. Uh, these chicks have emerged and they look like that. And our hearts are just busting open. And so this is the time of year in particular for us all to be aware and be really diligent and vigilant in support of these birds, keeping our cats indoors, keeping our dogs on leashes. And, and helping support them on their journey to fledging. So um, at the moment, I believe we have 111 um, chicks at Kilauea Point. We're really fortunate to have two nesting colonies at Kilauea Point. So our, our hearts are just busting this time of year when we get to see and help support these little cuties on their journey. So um, with that, enough about me and us. Um, we are here today 
<clears throat> to hear some incredible stories from Patrick Ching. And I'll say just a couple quick words about you, if I may. Patrick Ching, if you don't know him, I can't imagine if you don't, but uh, you will before we're done here today. He was born in Hawaii and has spent a lifetime teaching people about, uh, teaching people about nature through his art. Um, he grew up exploring the valleys and shore shorelines of Hawaii, and at age 16 decided to be a nature artist after seeing Hawaiian hawks in Pololu. Pololu, thank you, Valley for the first time. He'll tell you the story much better than I am. Um, but uh, Patrick volunteered for many wildlife organizations and eventually became a ranger out at Kilauea Point. And so it, we'll hear of, of, as well this full circle moment of him being a part of our mission and all that coming through to him uh, producing incredible books, producing beautiful artwork, being on TV, just being an, an incredible advocate for a wildlife, bringing it to people. And he's just uh, the nicest guy and fun and funny, and we're just in for a treat. So it's an honor to have you here today, Patrick. I'm gonna pass the microphone over to you. Oh, you're you gonna stick it on me? Okay. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Hmm. Okay, I got this. I got some folks at home. That's who I'm waving at also. I try not to go off screen too much, but um, I'll just yak a little bit about I, who I was, am, want to be. And uh, tonight I would like to share with you some of my art um, history and journey, but also share some... Um, Fun times from working at Kilauea Lighthouse and Hanalei from last century. Yeah, some of us was here last century. Um, I came to Kilauea Point in 1984 for the first time. And uh, you'll actually see pictures of my very first day. Oh, man, I might tell you a story that hardly anybody knows, too. When I met Dan Moriarty, that's a old time name of our main uh, lighthouse keeper. Um, for you artists out there, for you, some of you have been incubating for a long time, you might be ready to, you know, explore your artistic um, skills or talents or just grow them. Uh, I'm available tonight and afterwards if you want to talk art and, and, you know, growing through your life as an artist in the mindset of an artist. You know, the artists will notice more things than the average person walking through the world, look, the sky is blue, you know, the grass is green. Artists will look harder and closer. And when they think they've seen everything, they're going to look even harder and closer. And uh, they have a very special job in the world, artists do. So, you know, all of us, if somebody asks you if you're an artist, you can go say, yeah. You know, we're all different degrees of artists. And I love to see people uh, light up when they tell me what excites them. Um, I like to teach people about art, nature, and hopefully a little bit about themselves. <laughs> so I got a PowerPoint show. We used to call it a slideshow. Now, no matter if I come in front of the screen, it's still gonna, it's not gonna turn into a puppet show. Um, and we'll just have some fun along the way. I'll go in yak, I'll show you some pictures, and then after we can do some question and answer. And yes, even um, bird calls. <laughs> okay, so this is how we're gonna do it. Everybody can see that good? Okay. And da 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 da. Wild Inspirations by me, Patrick Ching. Um, and I'll, I'll let the slideshow start talking. Oh, by the way, this is a true story. And da 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 da. Okay, this is how I grew up in. Uh, on Oahu in Papakolea or Paoa Valley, uh, raised a lot by my auntie and uncle, my Chinese side. And uh, so, yeah, I was Chinese till I was like eight years old. <laughs> well, just raised in, you know, in a Chinese house. Um, the things that excited me were things that moved, birds, um, frogs. I just love animals, butterflies, grasshoppers. I still smell grasshoppers. And uh, every time I found an animal, that's what inspired me to run to the encyclopedia and want to learn how to read because I was such a late reader trying to mouth the words as all my other kids in the class were, 
you know, reading, I thought you guys are just trying to fool me, right? You're not really reading, are you? But um, I started running to encyclopedias and especially, uh, you know, the world book, that was our computer back then. I liked the pages with the frogs and the birds that had transparent pages where you can lift off the skin and see the muscles. You can lift off the muscles and see the organs. You can lift off the organs and see the bones. That always fascinated me. And as an artist, as I grew up, I used that very method to dissect the layers of nature. And so I can figure out how to rebuild what I see with paint. So whenever I'm seeing an animal, a tree, a sky, I'm trying to look closer than I ever have before, trying to notice a little more and figure out what to put down first and next and next. So for those of you that are interested in being artists or you know building your art school skills, um, we can we got a whole lifetime to talk later on about that or you be in touch with me. Um, I'll give little hints of it today and and like that. Okay, this was a video of those pages turning, but I don't think it's going to work. So we're moving on. Ah, there's me. Um, Growing up, that little boy turned into a skateboarder and, uh, you know, getting into as much trouble as I could. Um, I just I really wanted to be good at something for a lot of years. And, um, you know, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, and it eventually landed me in a program called Outward Bound. In Hawaii, it was called Hawaii Bound. But it was a time that changed my life. Uh, one month in the wilderness camping with 10 other juvenile delinquents, you know, and, and instructors. And uh, we camped in the forest, in the mountains, canoe, up to Mount Aloha, camping in the snow, in our ponchos, these kind of things. Um, so I thought it was a survival course, but it was way more than that. It was a communication course. But something happened during that trip. Um, and, you know, speaking of trip, it's the kind of typical, you know, high school art that I used to do. Uh, lots of, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but I got sent to this outward bound program. And our first week was in Pololu Valley in the Big Island. We we're camping under our tents, raining. You know, we learned how to make our ponchos into tents. And there is, I saw for the first time, uh, Hawaiian hawks screaming in the air. I, I'm like, what is that? And my instructor said, oh, that's Hawaiian hawk. You never heard of Hawaiian hawks? No. Well, they only occur in Hawaii. And that's the first time I ever heard that concept of native and endemic animals that evolved in Hawaii. I was kind of mad. You know, how come they don't teach us that in school? And uh, I remember I started drawing the hawk. And my instructor said, wow, you're a really good artist. You know, you ever thought of being an artist for a living? I'm like, no, you know, only like five crazy French guys ever going to do that. And um, but he went away, left me alone with me. And, you know, within a few minutes, I said, well, you know, I can paint better than anybody I know. I'm going to make my life as an artist. You know, it's the first time I found direction after years of searching for something to be good at that I said, you know, I'm going to teach people about nature through my art and I'm going to make it or die trying. And a lot of times, you know, I have to dig back and remind, remind myself of that promise. Uh, Cause a lot of times I felt like I was going to die trying, but I kept trying and uh, I kept living. So it's been a really fun journey. Um, it took me to be a volunteer with all kind of wildlife. It's a wallaby we got in Oahu since 1916. The original species can't even be found in Australia anymore. Um, but, you know, I like to be around volunteered with animals as I'm holding a couple wallabies there. But just animals that I like to be around and learn, you know, get to observe them so closely that I could learn how to paint them or draw them. And what really changed my artistic career was as soon as I uh, finished that course, my mom got me some art lessons from an oil painter, not an acrylic painter, which we all used in high school. Those paints are quite hard to work with compared to oils, which give you a lot of time to uh, work wet, where you can get these kind of fades like that. And um, so that was my first oil painting. 
And from then on, I was basically a professional artist. You know, I was selling my paintings, uh, making surfboards and cars, automobile painting on all my friends' things, rich little seventh grader, you know, um, or ninth grade, whatever I was in. But I had a great life as a, a young artist, just, you know, coming up like that. Um, I did go to, like, I got scholarships to colleges, and I went to about four colleges, uh, Otis Parsons in Los Angeles, you know, a lot of high-end art schools, but I still wasn't learning what I hoped to. And a lot of kind of stuff was getting encouraged that I didn't like. So I really just came back to Hawaii, started to paint the things that I loved. And so you see a lot of um, birds. I was kind of known as a bird artist in the beginning because I was so fascinated with Hawaiian birds. And there's our Hawaiian crow, our alala, which is also very endangered. This bird is a po uli. I got to uh, watch it for about a month every day going to the nest way up on Haleakala. But eventually, uh, this was the only nest ever found of that bird. It's a male feeding the female at a nest. And eventually the species uh, went extinct. And so in our lifetime, in our lifetime, so many, you know, species that were kind of abundant have gone extinct. Um, this was kind of my claim to fame when I was uh, about 24 years old. I was the youngest artist to do the Hawaiian telephone book cover, which went into every house in Hawaii. So it was a great rush to know I got selected. But when they told me what I was painting, the observatories and Halley's Comet, I'm like, oh, my heart sunk, you know. Um, it's not what I wanted to paint. So I convinced them to let me put some wildlife in those paintings too, in the lower areas. But another thing I was about to learn was what happens to printing when you make a million copies of something in the 1980s, 1986. Um, they went and had me take a picture. Everybody loved the painting. I was standing for the newspaper to take a picture next to the painting. And then somebody said, oh, toss them a book. And they tossed me this book and it was like black. And I'm saying, what is this? That's the phone book. And my patient, and then they took the picture, you know. But uh, my heart sunk so bad because, you know, they couldn't get the bright part and the dark part. So they kind of sacrificed the dark part and just all turned real black. I was so devastated. I swam out from Magic Island into the night and I wasn't coming back. I mean, I just couldn't think of anything. I just swam out into the ocean till the lights of Oahu were sparkling. And I'm, uh, you know, finally, I'm like, okay, Pat, you get back there and you do your best work. And that's how you're going to get over this. Because as a young kid, you know, I was devastated. Um, but I prayed real hard and this image came right to me. And it's probably my strongest piece to this very day. It's called Hidden Valley. And it has the right kind of angles and colors. And, you know, as an artist, you're leading your people through your painting on what you choose to put in there, how you arrange your darks and lights the angle of your objects, the back turn of the beak. You know, you're telling your viewer where to enter, where to go play, and where to exit in every painting, too. So there's a lot of psychological stuff that I learn as an artist that I try and teach my art students. If you ever take a class with me, I'm yakking the whole time, hoping that some of that's going to get absorbed, even the stuff that doesn't make sense at the time. Yeah, so that's called Hidden Valley. Um, my first day at Kilauea Point was in 1984. And luckily, Dan Moriarty was there and said, oh, great, I need some help. We got albatross, our first albatross up on Crater Hill that we got to go ban. So um, yeah, we go up there, we had a beat up old truck. You may hear in the future more stories of beat up old trucks up on Crater Hill. But we um, grabbed these birds to ban and uh, Dan realizes he forgot the bands down at the office. So this is a story I don't usually tell too much. But, you know, we get back in the truck and somebody's taking the picture. It was a photographer, very uh, well-known photographer. But that photographer would not hold a bird. So I had two birds in their beaks in my hand, birds under my arm. And uh, we were going down Crater Hill. And Dan hits a giant rock and boom, everybody just flies. And the bird's beaks come out. I grab the birds and their beaks are going shoo, 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 shoo. 
and my whole face got shredded with all their um, pointed beaks. And I just laughed. I loved it so much. Um, Dan's wife saw me my first day at Kilauea Point. What happened? Oh, it was great, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that's a that's a fun story. My first day at the first day on the job. I didn't even have my uniform yet. <laughs> yeah, but this is a picture of uh, myself with a, a kind of a turned into a mascot bird. Now before we didn't have hospitals for native birds. We didn't have hospitals for monk seals or anything. We got some now. But basically, we did what we could for any injured animal if we thought we could save it or try. And uh, I would take this bird, like I took this bird to Dr. Patrick Apana in Kapa'a, Apana Veterinary Clinic. And they did their best. But he told me, bird bones, they're very unlikely that bird's going to fly again. The bird bone was snapped on his wing. But the bird um, lived and was strong and would ride around on my bike. Um, with school groups would come, I'd throw him fish real fast, Opelu, and he'd catch them. And uh, so that bird was named Ruby the Booby. He was quite famous. He was like an ambassador. And then Sea Life Park finally uh, started to accept uh, injured birds. So he went, lived the, or she went and lived the rest of her life over there. And that is the ballad of Ruby the Booby. <laughs> um, this one is a video you want to try it this is up on crater hill oh go this is a good view of the refuge there's the sound the far point you got action of our refuge the kind of birds no. you see around oh. us these right here are the what <laughs> During this time of year and this time of There's day. There's a little delay, but. During their courtship. Um, we'll try to resync them here. Okay. okay. Um, okay. But yeah, that one says 1990. But the reason they're coming so close to over here is because it's probably. Talking a about traffic right, birds on right Crater uh, this, Hill near the, the three difference between area. The birds nesting. That's a 20 year old something kid. Birds <laughs> nesting on other parts of the island is that. Here we can offer them some protections. We do our best to control That's the last albatross chick. And we fence off the area that year. so that the dogs can't get in. This is the Laysan albatross. Hawaiians call it moli. This is the last chick on the refuge here at Kilauea Point. Uh, all the other birds have fledged or flown away already. You can see when the wind blows how the bird practices its flying and stretches its wings. And I think probably in a day or two, he'll probably up and fly away. So this is something strange was happening to the owls back then. I've been finding a lot of them dead by the side of the road. The whale, the one we have here, and the introduced barn owl are both being hit with some kind of a disease or a parasite or something that we really haven't figured out what's affecting them, but whatever it is, it seems to affect their vision and their ability to hunt. So you see a lot more owls hanging around the roadsides looking for mice on the road. And as a consequence, a lot more owls are being hit by cars. Um, this is a fairly recent occurrence, I'd say within the past five years, we've been noticing a lot more owls becoming sick and dead. This owl recovered enough to fly away after about a week. So we were thinking that they might have been getting poisoned from rodents ingesting poisons. But it was a kind of like a plague for a few years. Yeah. Okay. So um, what one of my fun things about that time of life was I started writing for the Hawaiian newspaper. Every month, a short little article that, you know, because it was short, people actually read it. And um Every month I would write about a different bird from my experiences. And by working at Fish and Wildlife Service and volunteering um, in other places as much as I did, I got to get really close to the animals that I wanted to paint. Um, the Hawaiian stilts, they also got sick at some times. I don't know what it was, you know, botulism or what, but I remember I, I had a very, uh, I was trying to nurse back to health a Hawaiian stilt which gave me a lot of opportunity to 
observe it and paint it. And this painting is called Hanalei Morning. And uh, the model was a, a stilt. I, I call him Stanley. Yeah. So he, he lived long enough for me to paint him and then he passed away. Yeah. Um, so back at the lighthouse days, you see how rusted it was before we had the major remodel. And May Days were really popular. It, we kind of celebrated the lighthouse birthday on those days. And um, here's, here's some of my old crew from uh, the maybe the 80s or 90s, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Noreen and Kevin, Joyce, Peo, Moose, Carol, myself. Yeah. Um, and then Kevin Pike in the back. And uh, Kathleen, Jerry. And Jerry Leinecke is the man on the end. So those are some old time names, our crew, yeah. But you know, before the, the Nene came to Kauai, and I know when they came, because Fish and Wildlife basically brought them here around, around 1990 or close to that. But the albatross, as soon as the lighthouse closed, all the albatross came to the lawn, like the Nene do now, but the Nene will kind of push out the albatross. Albatross ain't coming around now, because you know, there's, there was a turf war and a nanny one. <laughs> but that was painted for the 75th anniversary of the lighthouse. This is how the lighthouse looked in 1909 when it was built. Okay, so just, I don't even think it has its sign or paint on it yet. I got this from the lighthouse friends. And uh, you see how the windows were and everything like that. Yeah. But we would have, it was really special times when the lighthouse keepers got together. These are Coast Guard guys and women, uh, families. They had three houses, yeah? So they had eight hour shifts, making sure the light would turn. It turns like a cuckoo clock with a tunnel that goes through the three floors and waits like a cuckoo clock that had to be cranked up. So they take eight hour shifts and that's why they had three families living there, three houses. And um, this is Norman Peleholane and his wife, Pee Wee, they're really special to me because I actually grew up with them, not knowing that uh, I was gonna one day work at the lighthouse where they grew up. So he was Coast Guard, he had his son who was my really good friend, Mark Peleholani. There's me and Mark at the Hanalei Gourmet. There's us at, you know, later on when he had gray hair and I had hair. Yeah. And there they are as kids, the Peleholanis when, you know, this is in the 60s, there's Mark again. And over there, Jeff Zeich, uh, one of the lighthouse Coast Guard men over there too. So having Mark come over was a real special time for me. Every time he came over, we do service projects. He helps me work, pull weeds, whatever we're doing. And uh, we sure had a good time together. And then, um, my dad encouraged me to go get horses finally. And I said, oh, right. I always wanted a horse. He said, yeah, can you get a couple horses? Because we got a lot of fence line to when we acquired the uh, Fish and Wildlife acquired Crater Hill. We had to check the fence lines with horses. It, you know, we didn't have, uh, it was really rugged. So I finally got my first horse. That's Elima. I remember she bucked me off the first time I rode her. I said, I'll take her. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, she used to live up there, right? You know, even when I finished working for Fish and Wildlife and I was just signing books at the visitor center, we'd see Elima on the hill. She was up there. And um, that's her boyfriend, Kimo. Now, he's kind of famous now because um, he, he lived in Hanalei. He looked like a chess piece. He's a Morgan horse. And there's him, how thick his neck was. But, you know, being a stud horse, he was really well-behaved and and that's uh, my friend Les Milnes riding him on the right. My cousin was a ranger in Hanalei. That's um, Anthony Teixeira on his horse, Sienna, and me on Ilima back there. So, yeah, we went all over this island, including Hanalei and the re refuge, you know, on these horses. And uh, so Kimo kind of lives in perpetuity as a big fiberglass horse. I named him Kimo. And he kind of goes all over the place. Um, different islands. He's got a couple of stunt doubles too. But I kept my, you know, career um, for fish and wildlife. I just really wanted to be around the animals. I wasn't looking to get promoted to a desk job. 
And uh, I kept my art going. I, you know, made a living out of making art. This one is Mauna Loa Valley between Triple Hospital and Kaiser Hospital. They commissioned me to do this horse that one of the old time families owned, Patches Damon Holt. And uh, so that painting has been in the Kaiser Hospital for a long time. But you know, my dad, he's still, no matter what kind of success I was having, he's like, you know, Patrick, you know, if this art thing don't work, you gotta have something to fall back on. And uh, okay, dad, you know, so um, I, I joined the rodeo. Oh. And, and um, yeah, I thought that was pretty good to fall back on. So, <laughs> And uh, that was a good part of my life, a couple of decades of, you know, riding bulls. And um, eventually I became the rodeo clown. They call us bullfighters, but it was not a fight at all. Uh, I love entertaining the crowd and, and, you know, just dancing with the bulls, running around. Um, it did allow me to dine at some of the finest hospitals in the world. I went to New Zealand, California, San Luis Obispo, all the Hawaiian emergency rooms, everything. <laughs> and of course, I like to, you know, I, I just love the bulls, the, especially just in the pasture and just the beauty of the majestic masculine animal. Um, a lot of my life was living on the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. I took a lot of trips out there because I was able to take time and go for months at a time on little atolls. These were big islands like Oahu, but they've eroded to where they go under the ocean and then coral and sand forms on top of them. And that's what makes an atoll. And there's a whale skate. This is a little atoll right there in Hawaii. And, you know, amazing birds like our frigate birds, our boobies. Amazing they can live together when they're in battle in the air so much. Again, um, we worked really hard, but I had my pencil and even my painting supplies I would take so at night I could do my artwork. This was my first monk seal. It was like seeing a mermaid. I'd only heard about seals from books. You know, when I in high school it was the first time I ever heard of a Hawaiian monk seal. There were no Hawaiian monk seals, no sea turtles coming on shore when I was growing up. The turtles were still being hunted. Um, Ethan, you know, our family uh, dinners, not dinners, more parties, had turtle often. Uh, 1973, they became protected. But before that, you couldn't get close to one underwater. They would just bolt. They would never come ashore. A monk seal was maybe spotted once a year off of the main Hawaiian islands. And I thought, man, if I ever saw one, it's going to be like seeing a mermaid. So when I finally got my first trip out to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, I finally got to see my mermaid. And here she is. Yeah. This one, I got to watch this seal being born. That was, you know, and it was pretty quick. So I would do patrols around the islands, identify different seals, scar charts, tags if we could. Did a lot of tagging of seals. I was a high school wrestler, so it came in real handy. Yeah. But, um, and we, we did a lot of projects, even bringing in um, some males that were attacking and killing the females. The males would gang up on the females and bite their back when they mate, making these big scars that a lot of times the females died from them. So those kind of projects uh, are what I did when I went out to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, but also work with everybody else's projects too. The drawing of mom and, you know, I name them Keppo. They, always, they all got numbers, but you know, we like to give them names too. That's a big, uh, beautiful female. She's gravid. That means, you know, within eggs within her. You, you can kind of tell by the fat around the flippers and like that when they're gravid. And a lot of nests. Now, you might see or remember some videos of birds in Mexico where they, frigate birds will scoop down and eat the little turtles before they get to the ocean. But, you know, so strange. In Hawaii, we've never, I don't know anybody that's ever seen that happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but the Eva birds don't get the crabs before they get into the water generally. But something else does. It's the ghost crabs, big crabs. They'll take about 7 to 10% of the turtles and take them in and eat them in their holes, you know. So there's, you know, if, if a nest has 80 to 110 turtles and, you know, maybe 7 or 10% 
don't even reach the water. That's, that's telling you, you know, you got to have a lot of little turtles to have one live to be 30, 50 years old to reproduce. Um, I got to be real. I loved sharks when I got out there. In fact, my very first day, I had such an experience with shark. I painted this one. She's the first one that came up and uh, circled me while I was trying to take pictures of um, eagle rays. And then, you know, oh, man, it's the first time I've ever been circled by a shark. So I start swimming back or just going slowly. Just tell myself, you keep your heartbeat down, okay? And uh, after a while, you know, more sharks start coming. And they're circling me in two directions. And I'm like, okay, Pat, just act like you own the place. You know, don't get your heart, get out of hand. And after a while, I was, you know, pushing them off. And then they would send one after another at me and just charge me and whip their tail at me. And, you know, I'm like, am I, I still got all my parts, but eventually I just uh, stayed calm and got out of there. And when I got out, I took this picture and um, eventually I painted it. I called it the pool, but it also made a really nice abstract painting. I'm always looking for the abstract in nature and how things are balanced and full, you know, so that's, um, one of my favorite memories, and eventually, maybe 20 years later, I finally painted it. Um, there's some bigger sharks. Those are gray reefs. They'll bite people once in a while, but uh, these are tigers, and they come in real close to eat the birds. But, you know, they there's just swim so slow, like big catfish around most of the time. And uh, we had film crews. In fact, I would swim with the sharks so much that they gave me um, a job. Yeah, my job was to take the boat to the sharks, jump in the water, and show the film crew that the sharks don't bite. So, you know, there's a film guy, Norbert Wu. He's got a shark suit on, supposed to help if a shark bites you, not to get eaten. Um, well, they didn't give me no shark suit. <laughs> That's uh, East Island in the back of our tent. It had a telephone pole for, like, Loran signals and stuff. The island got wiped out a few years ago in a hurricane. Now it's just a little sand spit. But, you know, living out there, not so bad. You got uncrowded beaches and clean air, fresh water. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get bored. We make our calendar, the men with glass balls calendar. It never came out with that yet, though. And, and here's my friend Mark again. Remember Mark from the lighthouse? So he would come out and help me catch uh, food for these seals that we were rehabilitating. That's our little um, mannequin on the front or whatever you call that. Uh, but this is a day that we actually went past Kiri Atoll, which you might know is the last Hawaiian Atoll. And we ran out of gas and we were too embarrassed to call the Coast Guard guys and say we ran out of gas because you know we we're, were never here at the end of it. So we had one paddle and it took us about three hours. We were on our way to Japan already. And it took about three hours. We finally got back, and this is a picture when we got back. And anyway, yeah. <laughs> so these are some of the kind of pictures I like to paint from my experiences out there. And eventually, I I had a dream come true in you know creating books, but also a TV show called Painting in Paradise, kind of a nature show, and an art show, and it's meant for families, encourage families to do art together. Hey. Right, there's some the artists over there. Yeah. And I kind of travel all over the, this is San Diego with a lot of Hawaiian musicians, Jerry Santos, Kavi Kakahiapo, Frank Hewitt. Um, but the show's really the joy of my life. I work really hard on it. Oh boy. And uh, it's what I love to do, teach people about art and nature. And this is some of the books that I've created along the way. This one's coming out to Papahanaumokuakea. That's the name they now give to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So this is a color book that features a song that I made to help people learn the name of Papahanaumokuakea. Papa is the mother earth. Hanau means to give birth. Moku is the name for islands. Akea, the sky father. So basically it's the, it's the union of, of Papa and Wakea that gave birth to the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah. And we're coming out with that. I didn't bring any today. But I will be at the Kilauea Lighthouse uh, in two days to 
sign more books. And tonight I'll be hanging out too if you want to get any books or artwork too. That's the last time I fit into the Junior Ranger vest. Oh man, that thing is gold. You got pockets you can put a magnifying glass or a sketchbook or whatever. But, you know, I made my life out of taking my experiences and doing paintings with them. This is actually from a photograph that was kind of dull. I livened it up with the sunset. George Balaz did a photograph like that. The monk seals, they'll throw their arm over every, you know, other things, logs. Me, when I slept outside the first time, that's another story. There's a lot of stories for another time. <laughs> but here's more paintings based on my experiences. I, you know, I would go into the forest for weeks at a time, study rare birds, and a lot of them are, including this one, are in danger of becoming extinct. And this one, um, I do some of these paintings on things that I'd like to happen. This was painted before and they were Nene in Hanalei Valley. So I do a lot of paintings. And in fact, you know, I'm gonna go paint Eva birds, frigate birds, nesting on the lighthouse hill, hills again. But this was, um, this was Hanalei. Uh, I knew the Nene were coming cause the Fish and Wildlife was bringing them to Kilauea Point. And, you know, just, I like to try and make paintings that might help out nature move along. And, you know, it's amazing that we have a lot of animals. When I was growing up and being a ranger, being on the Northwest Hawaiians, I'm like, wow, this is such rare things we get to see. I never imagined we'd be at Hanalei Bay or and seeing seals and turtles come up and seeing birds. And, you know, I'm, we've got a lot of success stories as well as our, you know, our sad stories. Kauai's got a lot of success stories. A lot of it because we don't have mongoose here, but a lot of it because generally the people on Kauai are more in tune, I would say, than most places in Hawaii. And, um, you know, I, I paint them. I have a lot of art friends, artist friends. They're like, Patrick, how come your paintings come out the way you like and they look real? Or how come your paintings sell and mine don't sell? And I'm like, oh, you know, this and that. I didn't want to really tell them my secret, but you know, I'm getting kind of up there in years, and I figure I'd share my secret with you folks. <laughs> but I got something my friends don't have. I got myself an art frog. <laughs> yeah, this art frogs tell me what's good and what's bad, and you know. And um, if you get an art frog, make sure you get one with a good public image, one that likes people, and make sure you got one with good juicy art frog legs. You know, don't get a toad. And if you do get a skinny art frog, you just put them on a strict weight training program. And that's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Well, thank you for joining my little journey or part of it out there. And um, I'm going to you know, be around for if you folks have any questions of art or animals or history can make up some history. I don't know. Um, but I'll be here if you have any questions. Yes. Yeah, so every month I do a new episode on, called Painting in Paradise, and it features a different animal, generally, usually an animal. And I have them all on my YouTube. So Patrick Ching YouTube, if you want to keep busy, I have probably 50 episodes of all different animals in Hawaii, how to draw them to paint them and then some natural history. In fact, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we have the Oopu and stream animals episode coming. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, you know, most of them, you know, that island, it was called East Island where the shark crew, film crew was and that little house was. That was about 90% of the turtles nesting in the whole state. So most of our big green turtles go out there still, but now they're starting to nest in the main Hawaiian islands. Yeah, it took them a while to get, feel safe again among people, you know, being protected since around the 1973 time. Um, then they start coming up on the beaches in the 90s, little more, little more, little more, and generally feeling safe, just like the monk seals do. That's what I write about or do books about living among the other animals. Um, 
because we kind of forgot how or we might feel that, oh, this seal is a nuisance or this seal is taking my bait, this seal is taking my beach. Um, but just kind of letting some his setting up some history straight that, you know, they were here for probably hundreds of thousands of years or, or more, evolved into their own species in Hawaii. And um, so there's turtles nesting in all different parts now. Even Waimanalo, where I live on Oahu lately, um, they're nesting there a lot. Uh, I remember just wanting to see a turtle come up on Hanalei Bay. I painted it years before I ever saw one. And I lived on the bay, you know. So, um, you know, kind of knowing that they're coming. Uh, I like to encourage people to paint what you want to happen. Paint paint the good things in your life that just paint stuff that you want to happen, help it come along, you know? Yeah. Uh, they probably have. Yes. I think, I think uh, there might be confirmed nests at Hanalei Bay. I'll go check. I don't know for sure, but um, I, I think I recall that there was a confirmed nest. Yeah. But they're definitely digging. I know they were digging. They'll often dig false nests. And it might not be the right uh, sand density or whatever. But yeah, they'll definitely be nesting in Hanalei if they haven't already. The ones that go to the island. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed the same turtles here in the same areas year after year after year. Yeah. Nest. Yeah, I think a lot of times they go. So she's asking about um, if the same turtles come back. And yes, a lot of times. The turtles will come back to the same area where they were born and nest. It's not absolute all the time. We know that because they haven't nested in the main Hawaiian Islands for a long time, you know, for decades or centuries. We don't know. Um, you know, uh, when people are around, easy to catch animals are good food, flightless birds, turtles, monk seals. They probably were all around during, you know, before human in the main Hawaiian Islands. But you know, now that um, a lot of them are protected, they might take a, some decades, but they're coming back and they live among people. They go fall asleep at Waikiki Beach, monk seals, sea turtles, poipu, you know, good examples. So we're doing some things right, teaching everybody around to, you know, treat that animal like it's, you know, your family, because it is, <laughs> yeah. You get to ask a question, you want one? Is, are you are you asking a question? Oh, what for the for the Zoom? Okay. Uh, I have two. Uh, first one is so you had mentioned that you're going to be at the lighthouse on Thursday for signing books. What time? Yeah, Thursday from uh, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. I'll be at the Kilauea Lighthouse signing art and books, and I'm um, teaching you bird calls. <laughs> well, I'm show up. Uh, okay. <laughs> And then um, we haven't been lucky to see the local local indigenous birds. What was it like seeing them and seeing so many of them all together? Well, um, like on the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and even Kilauea Lighthouse was our first like annex of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Well, you know, um, the birds use every, every piece of land on top, underneath in burrows, on top shrubs in the air. So, so many birds use a small piece of land, but I just always felt um, that was real life out there. But now, you know, that real life is coming back and, and getting comfortable around the main Hawaiian islands. And Kilauea Point, uh, having so much of a protected area, you know, what is it, 100 acres? What? No, 30? Point? Yeah, Kilauea Point and Mo 199. Ooh. You know, so that's a lot of animals that's even pretty protected with fences and stuff like that, too, that birds can get a foothold again. I don't know if I answered the question. Okay. Yes. The Nene were, um, they brought them to Kilauea Lighthouse area first and let them loose over there. I'm not sure if they were from Big Island or they started at Honolulu Zoo. I don't know the answer to that, I'm sorry. But yeah, that was another success story because they were down to just a few birds, you know, a couple dozen birds at one time. Yeah. Yes. They seem to be everywhere. Yeah. Well, you could consider that, I, you know, if you felt like it, but um, I don't. <laughs> I rather much have that than 
having a, a species go extinct, especially a, such an amazing looking bird. Yeah. Could, I, could I add a thought really quick and it, it'll tie into something and then we'll come back to the room? Because um, I think it, it cues into what you're, you're talking about. Um, we are really fortunate here on the North Shore of Hawaii to have so many nene, uh, a species that was near the brink of extinction. Uh, we still have folks come visit us out at uh, Kilauea Point from Oahu who have never seen their state bird. The, the experience mm. is so vastly different here than in other parts of, of even on Kauai, but certainly on the other island, largely because we don't have uh, mongoose. There are areas of protection. There are people who care. It takes all of these things together. Our experience is vastly different. So the bird's experience is vastly different. And I think you're queuing into something that is very true. <laughs> we have to now enter into a new conversation of how do we coexist with a species that is thriving, that was here before mm. us, long before us. And it's often inconvenient and difficult and challenging, but it's our kuleana to find ways to, to make that work together. And um, if I could weave this into something, um, I, we've had the pleasure, um, the Friends Group, um, one of our goals is to increase awareness and pride in our wildlife. And so we recently had the opportunity to collaborate with several amazingly talented folks, Patrick Ching and our dear friend, Hob Osterlin, who is here today oh, yeah. and her work with the Kauai Albatross Network to produce uh, some additional radio PSAs with a goal of increasing awareness and increasing pride in the fact that Kauai is so unique. And so this gentleman, you've already got a sense of how talented he is in print and in art and other things. <laughs> and this will be a, a good transfer over to uh, uh, some of his thought about um, some of these bird calls. But if I may, uh, this is one of our PSAs that is currently playing on KKCR as well as all across the Kong radio group. Listen for it on the air because it's a hoot and I hope you enjoy it. So I'm going to play it here for you. 30 seconds. We've been raising our hana on Kauai for thousands of years, and Kauai is a wonderful place where we nest so close to the babies. In February, the babies went hatch, and this is so cute, buddy. Mahalo plenty, Kauai, one safe place for raise our kiki. This message from the friends of Kauai Wildlife Refuges. Learn more at kauaiirefuges.org. <laughs> 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 So with that, you might get him to do a few more. So I just wanted to have that segue. And my huge mahalo to Hob and Patrick for this incredible mm -hmm. campaign that you're going to hear on the airwaves for the next year. We're all going to just really enjoy it. So thank you. Yes. When are they going to open? I believe the end of April. It's, uh, it's almost uh, a 100 percent official date. So. Watch for That's watch for news percentage. end of April. <laughs> oh, we'll hear first. Uh, so five years, I'm in the Navy almost every day. Mm. Uh huh. Yeah. And I noticed. Um, so I've noticed you know, the same turtles. Are there frequently yeah. over this many span of time, uh -huh. and I always wondered. So, do they go off to lay their eggs and then come back here to me? Does anybody know? But it's the same. I'm well. You know, I don't know for sure, but most of the turtles of mature age, ready to breed, um, would used to go to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and to uh, East Island and come back. Yeah, so I don't know if those might be in breeding age. It's like 30 to 50 years old before they can mate. And it's, it's faster in captivity. They're feeding them much more nutritious food. So they get breeding age a lot earlier in captivity. But um, I don't know. I, I imagine that those turtles would go off and nest at Northwest Hawaiian Islands, come back. But now some of them might start nesting here more often. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good sign that they'll be nesting there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you know, that that kind of a time or ep epidemic or whatever you might want to call it kind of came and went. I think it was about a five year period. So maybe we don't know exactly what happened, why the owls of that time period were getting sick and dying or coming to the roads and getting hit by cars. I think the, the main consensus was that they were eating prey that had been poisoned. I don't know if much practices have changed, but the situations changed because most of the people I talk to about it aren't aware of it nowadays. Yeah, so um, maybe it, something was happening with use of poisons or, you know, I don't know if we know for sure what, it, what was going on there. Yeah, I think it's not as in focus as it was before. And you know, that owl, I didn't do anything except keep it for a few days and it got better and it was able to fly away. You see, when I first grabbed it, it couldn't even, it let me grab it, it didn't even try to fly. Yeah, yeah, yes. So the couple of things here, sunset tours that you're gonna have at the, in March 19th, is that right? Um, yes. So there's a lot of moly nests on the golf course. Mm. So you might be telling people that's going to be a draw. Yes, for sure. Yes, for doing that golf course uh, tour. Yeah. yeah, the golf cart. Tour. Yeah, thank you. So that might bring in some <laughs> more people to do it. Thank you. Um, and also the history with the Nene. Um, some of the Nene that um, were actually given as gifts in the Edwardian age to wealthy people in Europe. Yeah. And at that time, it was like super popular. If you uh -huh. were really wealthy, have birds uh -huh. on your estate. Yeah. And some of the DNA was saved by getting birds back from there. Right. That right. were given long ago. Yeah. So it makes a gene pool better. Yes. Sir yes. Peter Scott, an artist, was very instrumental in in breeding birds abroad. Right, and yeah. they they those were taken from the Big Island, yeah. if I remember right. And there was also there was an estate in Belgium and several in England and different mm -hmm. places. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I did have uh, some rescued um, Kaloa ducklings. Ah that I raised and because I worked for the state um, as emergency in the SOS program ah, before yeah, yeah. Year, years ago uh -huh. when we still were funded by the state. Right. Um, and I worked with Tom Telfer uh -huh. and Alan Silva and they had yeah. worked with the Nene um, release and they did the slow release program. Oh. So when my Kaloa, I said, I need to release my Kaloas. What do I do? And they said, oh, no, you just do this slow release program. They told me exactly what to do. And so the only sad thing I didn't tag my, my Kaloa. So I, after, you know, once they went wild, then I couldn't track them anymore. But oh, that good. was an amazing experience. <laughs> I was hanging out with Alan Silva, Alan Silva today, too. Oh, my God. Yeah. I yeah. haven't talked to him in years, but yeah. because of that time with them, I have some incredible photos. Oh, good. Close up of yeah. three Kolo, because there was three of them. Uh huh. And that would be really cool. Well, I know some artists I would love to oh, yeah. bring them to life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what, folks, um, I'm going to be here just hanging out. If you want to, you know, I'll be at the back of the room talking story. We can continue if you have any questions there. I might leave you with one thing, though. I want to see how many of you. Um, get to listen to the let's pick a bird like the new no wedge tail shearwater. You know, the wedge tail shearwater. You know, um, I tell you what, let's see your I'll start it off and then you can come follow in with me, okay? Because I live with so many wedge tail shearwaters. I mean, I thought I was one for a while. They'd be under the tent, they'd be under the house, crying like babies, and you could always tell them because they go, Oh. oh. So let's try that together, okay? All right, bring out your best shear water, okay? Go. That's 
that's on record. That was probably the best Shearwater colony in Princeville today. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye, you guys. <laughs> now, you've been around wild animals. Uh -huh. So I'm just wondering how you convince the male monk sales to behave better in the mating ah, department. Yeah. That was kind of rough. It was rough. It was rough. 